In 1857, 22-year-old Watson Shannon was trudging along the Nobby Range in central Otago. He and his brother Alexander came from a big sheep farming family from the southwest of Scotland. They were looking for land to do the same thing in New Zealand. As the brothers crested the ridge and looked down into the Manuhirikia Valley, Watson realised they'd found the perfect spot. He turned to his brother and said, Here is the country we are looking for, a land well grassed and watered, a very land of promise. To start with, Things went well. Just like Watson said, central Otago was perfect sheep country. A boom in wool prices combined with the gold rush in the 1860s made Otago and Southland the economic heart of New Zealand. But a few decades later, everything had changed. Hills and gullies that used to be a scene of perfect sylvan beauty now look like a deserted waste, as though some deluge had swept vegetation off the earth. So what happened? Well, these guys happened. Kia ora, I'm Marnie Dunlop. And I'm William Ray. And this is the Aotearoa History Show. The rabbit plagues of the 19th century were one of the greatest economic and environmental disasters in New Zealand history. They turned thousands of hectares of farmland into desert and sucked up millions of dollars in taxpayer money. And they prompted people to introduce voracious new predators to Aotearoa, which are still devastating native wildlife today. Not the best decision of all time. Nope. So let's start with how rabbits got here in the first place. Just like pretty much every other mammal in Aotearoa, they hitched a ride with humans. The first introduced mammals were the kiore and kuri, Polynesian rats and dogs brought to Aotearoa by the ancestors of Māori about 700 years ago. Several hundred years later, in 1769, Royal Navy Lieutenant James Cook arrived and his first expedition introduced a bunch of new animals. Some were stowaways like ship rats, others were accidental escapees like cats which had been brought along to keep the rats under control. There were also goats, sheep and pigs which were deliberately released into the bush or gifted to Māori. But when Cook arrived back in Aotearoa on his second voyage, he learned some had been eaten rather than kept for breeding and complained. Thus all our endeavours for stocking this country with useful animals are likely to be frustrated by the very people who we meant to serve. This idea that New Zealand needed more useful animals was very strong among early European explorers and colonists, and we're not just talking about farm animals. Colonists tried to improve pest control by introducing insect-eating animals like sparrows and hedgehogs. They tried to improve hunting by bringing deer, pheasants and ducks. Some even tried introducing more exotic animals like moose, monkeys and even zebra. Many of these animals failed to adapt, of course, but others thrived and some became serious pests, which brings us back to rabbits. The first rabbits came to New Zealand in the 1830s, but we don't know exactly who brought them here and in what numbers. Historian Joan Druitt puts it like this. The records of the introduction of rabbits are unclear, mostly because once introduction became an embarrassing topic, no one was anxious to claim responsibility. The American writer Mark Twain put it even more bluntly when he visited Otago in 1895. The man who introduced the rabbit there was banqueted and lauded, but they would hang him now if they could get him. Rabbit introduction was a joint effort by individual colonists and acclimatisation societies. These were like government-supported clubs which raised money to import all kinds of animals. And one of the animals they were optimistic about were rabbits. In their eyes, rabbits were the perfect animal to bring to a new colony. Easy to carry on ships, they bred fast, you could eat them and sell their skins. Super useful. But if there's one thing rabbits love, it's making more rabbits. Your average rabbit starts breeding at three months old and it can produce a new litter of six or more baby bunnies nine times a year. And that's not cute. In ideal conditions, you can go from two rabbits to a million rabbits in just one year. As early as 1866, parts of Southland were overrun and the rabbits were moving north into Otago. 
It turned out the Lower South Island was a rabbit paradise covered with tussock grassland, perfect rabbit food. There wasn't too much rain, so their burrows didn't flood, and the only native predators were weka and kahu, neither of which put a dent in their exploding numbers. In 1867, a group of worried farmers wrote to the Otago Acclimatisation Society warning against more releases. But the society kept releasing more rabbits until the 1870s. We have no idea how many rabbits were in Aotearoa by the 1870s. Tens of millions, a hundred million, there were far too many to count. The newspapers were full of farmers worrying about rabbits. Incredible as it may appear, I have seen a field of 40 acres completely denuded of grass and thousands of those four-footed pests hopping about its surface. Throughout Southland, rabbits swarm, in fact are a plague, ruinous alike to crops and pasturage. Some farmers reported huge numbers of sheep starving to death or becoming so weak they couldn't stand. But rabbits were actually only part of the problem. To understand this, we have to wind back about 500 years. Before humans came to Aotearoa, Otago and Southland were mostly covered in forest. When Māori arrived, much of that forest was burned down, probably to make it easier to hunt more. By the time European colonists turned up, that forest had been replaced by tussock grasslands. Then those colonists started their own fires. Colonial farmers set fire to their land because sheep find it easier to eat the new growth which shoots up after a fire. But some farmers burned their land too often and overstocked with too many sheep, meaning the tussock didn't have time to recover. So these plants were barely holding on as it was. Then the rabbits came along and finished them off. With the tussock gone, there was nothing to hold the topsoil together. In just a few decades, massive areas of productive farmland in Otago and Southland had turned to desert. According to one story, when a government official visited central Otago to see the damage, he said, this country is not worth saving. Let the rabbit have it. Many farmers abandoned their land. Others held on. At the height of the plague, one Otago run holder recorded his yearly produce like this. Two bales of wool taken from live sheep, five bales plucked from dead sheep, six bales of rabbit skins. At first, farmers caught and killed rabbits themselves, but by the 1880s, most turned to professional rabbit catchers or rabbiters, many of whom were former gold miners. Rabbiters had a hard life. They'd ride over the grasslands, setting traps, spreading poison and gathering their catch, often more than a hundred rabbits a day. By nightfall, every one of them had to be gutted, skinned and hung out to dry. As one rabbiter called Lou Warlich said, By the time you'd done all that, come back at night, cooked your meal and fed your horse and tied up your dogs and did the little bit of washing up you had to do in a tin basin or whatever, the day was gone. It was a lonely life. The horse and the dogs were all the company you had. Lots of rabbiters were single men living alone in ramshackle huts or tents, but some started families. Doris Jackson and her husband lived in a rabbiter's camp in the Lindis Valley with two preschool-aged children. Their hut was two and a half by three metres with a corrugated iron roof and canvas walls. Inside was an armchair Doris made out of packing case timber and sugar bags stuffed with tussock, plus a bed just big enough for the four of them. We lived in primitive conditions, but it was always home, always callers coming, and between work we had many happy times, attending country dances, etc. We had good health, we were a family, and had good friends around us, and we were progressing financially. In fact, the Jackson family eventually made enough money to buy a small orchard, and they weren't the only ones making a living from rabbits. Rabbit skin hats and gloves were super popular in Europe and North America, and by the 1890s, New Zealand was exporting 17 million skins a year. Rabbit meat canning factories were set up all over Otago and Southland, and after refrigerated shipping was invented in 1882, we exported frozen rabbit meat as well. From the perspective of the working poor, the rabbit plague was kind of a good thing. It provided a lot more jobs than sheep farming did, especially in the long depression of the 1880s and the Great Depression of the 1930s. Landowners sold the rights to kill rabbits on their land, so they made money from rabbit skins and meat too. But for them, the profit from rabbits never outweighed the losses in wool production and cost and damage to pasture. 
Politicians were under constant pressure to find solutions to the rabbit problem. Some New Zealanders demanded heavy fines for landowners who failed to get rid of rabbits. But others argued these strict policies put unfair burdens on farmers. Politicians built hundreds of kilometres of rabbit-proof fences. But it turned out those fences weren't as rabbit-proof as they hoped. The government lowered taxes on ammunition for shooting rabbits and offered bounties for rabbit ears. But that just encouraged people to cut off the rabbit ears and let them go. This was a common theme in rabbit pest control. Sure, rabbiters would catch plenty of rabbits, but they were always careful to leave some alive. After all, if the rabbits vanished completely, so would their jobs. The government was getting frustrated. In 1883, the Superintendent Inspector of Rabbits, what a title, Benjamin Bailey, told Parliament, no means of destruction have been devised or adopted that deals comprehensively with the pest. I see but one solution, and that is the introduction of their natural enemy. By natural enemy, Benjamin Bailey meant things which eat rabbits. And he wasn't alone. According to historian Joan Druitt, one animal dealer in Dunedin offered five shillings per cat to meet the demand. The small boys of Dunedin had a heyday, and the cats arrived in short order. These were sold to pastoralists, taken out onto the run and released, just as police were being bombarded with complaints from hundreds of pet owners that their beloved moggies were missing. But cats alone weren't cutting it, so people started to look at introducing other predators, particularly ferrets, this mate over here, stoats and little weasels. When the news made it back to Professor Alfred Newton, an ornithologist at Cambridge University in the UK, he hit the roof. The proposal to send out ferrets or polecats to New Zealand, there to be turned loose, has filled me with alarm and horror. What remains of New Zealand's native birds will absolutely and almost instantaneously disappear. Many local scientists agreed, and even some farmers. And today we can look back and say, of course they were right. Um, but at the time, the pro-predator faction said the fears over introduced predators were overhyped. We look to Britain and find that notwithstanding the presence and numbers of foxes, stoats and weasels, lambs are reared, the birds of the air survive, and the poultry of the farmyard are not among things of the past. So it will be in New Zealand. Nature has a method of preserving a balance amongst her numerous subjects. What that writer and many others failed to understand was that Aotearoa was nothing like Britain. Professor Newton pointed this out in his letter back in 1876. New Zealand's fauna is altogether ignorant of any enemy, such as a ferret would be, and as you know, many of its birds, the likes of which do not exist elsewhere, are unable to fly. But there was another argument. Many 19th century colonists described New Zealand's birds as decadent and inferior and doomed to extinction, much in the same way they described Māori. They argued any attempt at conservation was pointless. They were wrong, because we're still here. Anyway, like the Rodney MP John Sheehan said in a debate over setting up reserves for native forests in 1874, the same mysterious law which appears to operate when the white and brown races come into contact and by which the brown race, sooner or later, passes from the face of the earth, applies to native timber. The moment civilization and the native forest come into contact, that moment the forest begins to go to the wall. But there's a problem with that statement, right? Actually, many problems. Because this isn't some natural mysterious law, it's about choices. People were choosing to cut down native forests. People were choosing to take land from Māori and give it to colonists. And people were choosing to introduce new predators which they knew would devastate native animals. And our mate, Professor Newton, pointed this out. You may say that the New Zealand fauna is already doomed, and indeed I fear that the greater part of it will become extinct. But we know not which or how many of its members may be preserved if some care or consideration be shown towards it. But many colonists saw Aotearoa as a blank canvas where they could create a new, better version of Europe. There was no room on that canvas for New Zealand's native plants, animals or people. Here's how John Turnbull Thompson put it. He was the Surveyor General of New Zealand in the 1870s. Crude sentiment regrets the waning of the Aboriginal race. Mature judgment cannot. For we ask ourselves, is it better to have a forbidding wilderness fixed in gloomy forest and tangled fern, or a lovely garden set in green fields and waving corn? And look, not every Pākehā thought like this, plenty pushed back. But they were up against powerful ideologies, and they were up against economics. 
So in the end, the conservationists lost the argument. As an Otago farmer and politician reportedly said, if it came to a question of birds or sheep, I would certainly vote in favour of the sheep. Between 1884 and 1886, 4,000 ferrets, 3,099 weasels and 137 stoats were released into the wild. Their impact on rabbits is unclear. Some farmers reported huge success, others saw no change. On the other hand, Professor Newton's warnings about the risks to native wildlife were spot on. As the Otago Witness reported in 1918, in the Holyford Valley, the Weka, Kiwi and Kakapo were almost exterminated. In the Makaroro Valley, these used to be plentiful, but since the advent of the stoats and weasels, they are very rare and rabbiting tallies have not depreciated. In the meantime, the impact of rabbits on sheep farmers subsided, partly thanks to rabbit control methods, but mostly due to refrigerated shipping. Refrigeration meant sheep farmers could export meat as well as wool, which offset the losses from rabbits. The thing which finally ended the rabbit plague was fashion. In the 1940s, people stopped wearing rabbit skin hats and gloves. Prices plunged and Aotearoa's rabbiting industry collapsed. With nobody making money from catching them, rabbit numbers at first went through the roof. But it also meant there was nobody arguing in favour of rabbits, so the government could get serious about systematic extermination. And thanks to some technological leaps over the next few decades, they had a whole lot more tools in their rabbit killing arsenal. Mostly these were new kinds of poisons, particularly 1080, which could be dropped from the air, vastly reducing the costs of control in remote areas. The government also passed new anti-rabbit laws. They outlawed the sale of skins and meat to remove any incentive for rabbit farming. In fact, it was illegal to even keep pet rabbits in New Zealand until 1980. And this tough stance on rabbits worked, for a while at least. By the 1960s and 70s, areas of Otago and Southland, which had been reduced to wasteland, started growing grass again. It'd be nice to say everyone lived happily ever after, but not so much. Hungry stoats and weasels swarmed off the farms and into the bush looking for food, which was bad news for native birds. And in the 1970s, authorities took their foot off the gas. The official policy shifted from eradication to management. This turned out to be a mistake. By the 1990s, Aotearoa was facing another rabbit plague. This time a huge argument erupted about a new method of control, a deadly rabbit disease, Khaleesi virus. The government initially refused to use the virus, so in 1997 a group of farmers illegally imported and released the disease for themselves. As one said, for years we'd been forced to stand by and watch as rabbits denuded our paddocks and turned them into a dust bowl. It was a simple choice, get Khaleesi or go bankrupt. And even though the release of the Khaleesi virus was a major breach of New Zealand's biosecurity laws, nobody was ever prosecuted. For the next couple of decades, rabbit numbers plunged, but now, yet again, that's starting to change. Today, increasing numbers of rabbits are immune to Khaleesi virus and populations are growing rapidly. In 2021, journalist Melanie Reid wrote this about a visit to one farm in Otago. The infestation is obvious. Dozens of rabbits hop around on the dirt and it is just dirt. Some paddocks are somewhat protected, others are dust bowls, riddled with burrows, forfeited entirely to the pests. The history of rabbits is a story of a supposedly useful animal that turned out to be anything but. It's also a story of short-term solutions and long-term consequences. Consequences which are still playing out now, nearly a hundred years later. It's an example of how colonisers didn't only colonise people and land, but colonised our natural world, one of our most sacred taonga, our taiao. Thanks for watching our show. Hei kona. Thanks for watching our show. If you want to learn more about the history of rabbit plagues, we've put the links to some of our sources in the description below. One we found particularly helpful was a paper by historian Rachel Edgerton, Unconquerable Enemy or Bountiful Resource, a new perspective on the rabbit in central Otago. Catch you next episode.